I'm Marjorie Mead, Interim Director of the Wade Center, and I'm delighted to welcome you to a very special evening. We are privileged tonight to have our president, Dr. Philip Riken, as the inaugural speaker for the launch of the Ken and Jean Hansen Lectureship. This annual Wheaton College Faculty Lecture Series is named in honor of former college trustee Ken Hansen and his wife Jean, and generously endowed in their memory by Walter and Darlene Hansen. We are very grateful. The idea for this lectureship originated with our friend and former Wade director, Chris Mitchell, who based the three-part format upon the Rydell Memorial Lectures at Durham University, where during World War II, C.S. Lewis gave talks that were later published as Abolition of Man. It is the hope of the Wade Center that the Hansen Lectureship will encourage Wheaton College faculty, staff, and students, as well as those from our local community, to look more deeply into the literary treasures we house here at the Wade. And that our conversations and understanding of the writings of the seven authors will be enriched and strengthened as a result. It is a special pleasure to introduce Dr. Walter Hansen who has invo been involved with the Wade Center since its inception, and who currently serves as a member of the Wade Board. A 1968 graduate of Wheaton College, Dr. Hansen is the author of various works of New Testament scholarship. Professor Emeritus at Fuller Seminary, Dr. Hansen has over 40 years of ministry experience, both in pastoral and academic context, including serving abroad in Singapore. In addition to his New Testament scholarship, Dr. Hansen is deeply interested in the relationship between the visual arts and theology, indeed, the literary arts as well. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Hansen. Thank you, Marge. I'm very grateful for a few minutes to explain the name and purpose of these lectures. I was uh, walking around campus and saw this big poster, and I could almost hear my father say, even though he died uh, 20 years ago, oh my goodness, son, what have you done to us? <laughs> you, know, you know we don't like our name on anything. I figure he's probably mellowed out a bit by now, and <clears throat> wouldn't mind. And anyway, I heard some place is good to honor your parents, so here we go. Uh, I'd like to give a, a little bit of background to this name. Marion Wade passed through death into the Lord's presence on November 28, 1973. As my father related that event to me, he was at the bedside when Marion Wade passed into glory. He said Marion Wade's last words to him were, Remember Joshua, Ken. <clears throat> Joshua, remember, was the leader who followed Moses, Moses the leader of God's people, and then he died and Joshua became the leader of God's people. And my father followed Marion Wade in the leadership of the company. <clears throat> when I uh, walk through the Wade Center and see this picture of Marion Wade, I often stop and give thanks to God for him. He had a huge influence on my life and on our family. Uh, he was the one, my father said, who really launched him in his life, career, and business, and owed so much to him. And I grew up with him as kind of the ultimate mentor and hero in our family. Uh, Darlene and I were married during uh, the middle of my senior year here at Wheaton in December 1967. And uh, in January, uh, the Wades, Mary and Lou, were, were some of our first guests that we had over to our apartment on uh, 814 College Avenue. <clears throat> and uh, I could tell you some stories about that evening, but I wanted to have Darlene get to know the greatest ever storyteller in my life, Marion Wade, amazing man. So uh, soon after his death, my father and some friends at Service Master were looking for a way to honor their mentor and leader and decided to uh, give a gift to Wheaton College. And I can well imagine my father thinking through what would be a good way to honor Marion Wade and decided to uh, 
make a little connection happen and had him uh, be the one honored at the Wade sent at the at the collection, uh, Kilby's collection of papers, which had started some years before. And so that collection of books from Lewis and Tolkien and the other five authors was renamed in honor of Marion Wade. Marion Wade was the founder of Service Master and uh, Service Master associates and friends and members of the Wade family uh, gave the initial gift to rename uh, the Kilby collection in honor of Marion Wade. Uh, I, when I was a student here uh, in the fall of 67, my folks were also students here. I thought that was kind of cool that my parents were students when I was a student. And they took a, a course from Clyde Kilby in his living room. Uh, only nine could take the course so they could sit comfortably in the living room. And I'm told Martha served tea and cookies was her forte. And uh, they were, my parents were avid readers and collectors and promoters of the books of the Inklings. In fact, they hosted a book club in their living room uh, by authors uh, connected with the Wade Center. And Clyde Kilby came to lead that uh, book discussion. And when my parents moved from Wheaton to Santa Barbara in 1977, they named their home in Santa Barbara Rivendell. Uh, that's how important it was to them. And uh, everyone who came to their home uh, were well aware of how their home fulfilled Tolkien's description of Rivendell. And so at last, they all came to the last homely house and found its doors flung wide. The house was perfect whether you liked food or sleep or work or storytelling or singing, or just sitting and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture of them all. Their clothes were mended as well as their bruises, their tempers, and their hopes. Their plans were improved with the best advice. My parents had a little plaque with this uh, saying inscribed uh, on their wall as their vision for what they wanted their home to be. And members of our family treasure so many times that we were in the home and we spoke in a kind of cold language rather than just ordinary English. We use metaphors and images from uh, Tolkien and Lewis and that was a real uh, bridge of Kazadum experience or that, that was a, <laughs> a wonderful restful time at Lothlorien wherever we had just been or so on. We spoke in this kind of you know, secret language uh, borrowed from these authors. Uh, in fact, uh, they, my parents had friends from uh, the college come often, and one cold February, uh, Clyde and Martha Kilby stayed for two weeks. Uh, they escaped the deep freeze of Wheaton to thaw out and to uh, recover for two weeks at my parents' Rivendell home in Santa Barbara. My parents set up a family foundation in 1985 and it was no surprise to us that they named the family foundation Rivendell Stewards Trust. So there you get a sense again of the centrality of these stories in their lives. Uh, I picked off a few books from <clears throat> my father's, uh, my shelf, but really my father's books. And uh, this one, there's my parents and my brother Kenny at their Rivendell home in Santa Barbara. This uh, book is signed by Clyde Kilby called Images of Salvation in the Fiction of C.S. Lewis. And the dedication says to Jean and Kenneth Hansen. I kind of like that because so often my father is mentioned and my mother gets only put in a parenthesis. But actually, she was the literary one of the two. She was the real uh, in-depth reader of the two. Uh, so I'm very happy that she got some of the credit there in that uh, introduction. So I think it's fitting to name this lectureship in honor of my parents, uh, the Ken and Jean Hansen lectureship. I hope you do as well. What is the purpose of this lectureship? Well, I've lifted uh, one word from uh, a quote by uh, Tolkien and before I, we read this quote, I should explain that when Tolkien wrote this uh, essay called On Fairy Stories, 
Fairy stories today has a very negative connotation. I mean, oh, it's just a fairy story. But for Tolkien, that was one of the best categories ever of literature. That's what he called his own writings. The Lord of the Rings is a fairy story, according to Tolkien. So he says in this essay, I have claimed that escape is one of the main functions of fairy stories, and since I do not disapprove of them, it is plain that I do not accept the tone of scorn or pity with which escape is now so often used, a tone for which the uses of the word outside literary criticism give no warrant at all. And what the misusers are found of, fond of calling real life, escape is evidently, as a rule, very practical and may even be heroic. So Tolkien is not talking about escapism, escapism or an avoidance of reality, but rather the idea of escape as a means of providing a new view of reality, the true transcendent reality that is often screened from our view in this fallen world. Hear what Tolkien has to say a little bit further in the next paragraph about the concept of escape in literature. Evidently, we are faced by a misuse of words and also a confusion of thought. Why should a man be scorned if finding himself in prison, he tries to get out or go home? Or if, when he cannot do so, he thinks and talks about other topics than the jailers and prison walls. The world outside has not become less real because the prisoner cannot see it. In using escape in this derogatory way, the literary critics have chosen the wrong word. And what is more, they are confusing, not always by sincere error, the escape of the prisoner with the flight of the deserter. So I'm not proposing that these lectures give us a way of escape from our responsibilities or ignore the needs of the world around us, but rather that we explore the stories of the seven to free us from a distorted view of reality, from a sense of hopelessness, and to awaken us to the true hope of what God desires for us and promises. And then a quote from uh, C.S. Lewis in his book, An Experiment in Criticism, which also speaks of escape from prison. We want to escape the illusions of perspective. We want to see with other eyes, to imagine with other imaginations, to feel with other hearts as well as with our own. The man who is contented to be only himself, and therefore less a self, is in prison. My own eyes are not enough for me. I will see with through those of others. In reading great literature, I become a thousand men, yet remain myself. Here, as in worship, in love, in moral action, and in knowing, I transcend myself, and am never more myself than when I do. The purpose of the Hanson Lectureship is to enjoy the great literature of the seven, so that we can escape from the prison of our self-centeredness and our narrow parochial perspective in order to see with other eyes, to feel with other hearts, and be equipped for practical deeds in real life. Since we are looking at images in Middle Earth tonight, I've selected just one short uh, image from uh, the escape recorded in The Return of the King. This scene happens uh, just after the ring of power is thrown into the fire and Frodo and Sam have escaped and they're sitting on a little top of a little crag outside of the crack of doom. I am glad that you are here with me, said Frodo. Here at the end of all things, Sam. Yes, I'm with you, Master, said Sam, laying Frodo's wounded hand gently to his breast. And you're with me. And the journey's finished. But after coming all that way, I don't want to give up yet. It's not like me somehow, if you understand. Maybe not, Sam, said Frodo. But it's like things are in the world. Hopes fail, an end comes. We have only a little time to wait now. We're lost in ruin and downfall, and there's no escape. That's the way things are in the world. We are lost in ruin and downfall, and there is no escape. <clears throat> but then suddenly, a turn comes in the story, and we see in the next scene that ruin and downfall, the end of all things, the worst catastrophe 
is a good catastrophe, a you catastrophe. Our sorrow turns to joy. Tolkien coined the word, you catastrophe, the good catastrophe. As he says, a you catastrophe is a sudden and miraculous grace. It gives the reader a catch of breath, a beat and lifting of the heart, and a piercing glimpse of joy and heart's desire. It's the way things are in the world. You mess up your notes and can't find your place. The gospel, Tolkien says, is the greatest and most complete conceivable you catastrophe. This story has entered history and the primary world Art has been verified, legend and history have met and fused. It is my hope and prayer that the Hansen Lectures on the Seven will give the hope and joy of the most complete and conceivable you catastrophe to all who have reached the end of themselves and see no way of escape. I picked up another book that I have from my father's library it's uh, Tolkien, the Silmarillion by Clyde Kilby. Again, a little note from Clyde Kilby to Jean and Ken with love. <clears throat> and then I noticed just this morning that my father, as he would do, uh, write a little note when he read it. <clears throat> and this says, read 1191. My mother died in 1989. And those years after my mother died were terrible, dark years for my father without her in his life. And he wrote, 1191, I must have read earlier, but this reading was a special one for me. How I would enjoy rereading with my gene. That was your life, rereading these kinds of books. And when my father was dying of liver cancer, <clears throat> uh, the early part of 1994, and the last few months, I spent every other night with him. And he would say, tell me a story of Jesus, son. Read a Father Brown story, son. Let's hear a Lord Peter Whimsey story, son. How about a couple scenes from the Return of the King? Let's read Sir Gibby the next few weeks together. And that was our life, the uh, last few months of his life. So I know from that experience that these stories give great consolation and courage to face, as Tolkien says in the same essay on fairy stories, <clears throat> the great escape from death, passing through death into the presence of the king. Drawing from uh, familiar images in Tolkien's great story, I offer this benediction on all who hear and read the Hansen Lectures. May you find healing at Rivendell and receive gifts for your journey at Lothlorien. May you escape the darkness of mortar on eagle's wings. May you always love and be loved in the fellowship of the king. Amen. And now I'm very happy to sit down and listen to Dr. Phil Riken. Uh, I'm glad for the opportunity to introduce him as our inaugural speaker for the Hansen Lectureship. The overarching theme for Dr. Riken's three lectures will be, <clears throat> the Messiah comes to Middle Earth, images of Christ's threefold office in the Lord of the Rings. Dr. Riken graduated from Wheaton College in 1988. He is the eighth president of the college and has served in that capacity since 2010. Dr. Riken holds a Master of Divinity degree from Westminster Theological Seminary and a doctorate in historical theology from the University of Oxford. Following his time at Oxford, Dr. Riken joined the pastoral staff at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia in 1995, serving there until his appointment at Wheaton. A prolific author and accomplished speaker, Dr. Riken's talk this evening, and the first in this series of the three, is on the prophet, prophetic ministry of Gandalf the Grey. <clears throat> 
Join me in welcoming Dr. Eichen. As the nine walkers seek passage through the Misty Mountains by way of Moria, they face terrifying evil. Dark spirits have been awakened from the deep, and their drumbeats roll through the mind, echoing in the caverns, throbbing fear into the heart of the Fellowship of the Ring. Doom, doom. A grim company of orcs attack, accompanied now by massive trolls. Doom, boom. Doom, boom. As they run for their lives, the leader of their company, Gandalf the Grey, suddenly faces a great shadow, in the middle of which was a dark form of man-shaped maybe, yet greater, and a power and terror seemed to be in it and to go before it. In its right hand, a blade like a stabbing tongue of fire, in its left it held a whip of many thongs. The fell creature was a Balrog, one of the last fiery demons who rebelled against Iluvatar, the one god. As the fellowship came to the final bridge out of the mountains, the bridge of Khazad Doom, Gandalf sought to hold the narrow passage long enough for his friends to escape. You cannot pass, the wizard said. Go back to the shadow. For a moment, the Balrog seemed to wither, but then he drew himself up to full height, leapt upon the bridge, and struck with deadly force. At that moment, Gandalf lifted his staff, and crying aloud, he smote the bridge before him. The staff broke asunder and fell from his hand. A blinding sheet of white flame sprang up. The bridge cracked. Right at the Balrog's feet it broke, and the stone upon which it stood crashed into the gulf, while the rest remained poised, quivering like a tongue of rock thrust out into emptiness. With a terrible cry, the Balrog fell forward, and its shadow plunged down and vanished. But even as it fell, it swung its whip, and the thongs lashed and curled about the wizard's knees, dragging him to the brink. He staggered and fell, grasped vainly at the stone, and slid into the abyss. Fly, you fools, he cried, and was gone. Or maybe you remember the scene more like... to the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Arnold. Dark fire shall remain with you, flame of Uldun! It's easy to recognize Gandalf's heroic stand against the Balrog as an act of Christ-like love. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. But what I wish to argue in this lecture is that Gandalf is Christ-like in a particular way, that his work as wizard is analogous to the ministry of the bi biblical prophets and thus illuminates both the office of Christ as prophet and also the prophetic office of every Christian. But this is only one third of the argument I wish to make over the course of these inaugural Hansen lectures. And let me pause now for a moment to say how wonderfully named they are. <laughs> 
Um, it was my privilege as a small boy to be with my parents in the Hanson home. I've experienced that Rivendell hospitality, uh, the warmth of their home. I think one of the reasons why I remember that, partly because I spent time with Kenny and that was memorable for me, um, as we've talked about before, Walter, but I think also because the quality of hospitality we experienced that evening and what the warmth of that evening was a memorable thing um, in itself and therefore a particular privilege um, to have the opportunity to deliver this inaugural lecture. Uh, also just knowing um, how your father Ken and, and your mother too, through, through their generosity, supported scholarship at Wheaton College. Um, our family has benefited from the generosity of your family now over two generations, so that's, that's something to celebrate. And you have um, tonight not only honored your parents, but also um, extended their legacy. And we, we all celebrate that tonight, we're very grateful. There are, and let me just also say, thank you for coming tonight on this uh, cold, blustery night. Um, so, so great to have you here uh, this evening. There are really, I think, three main Christ figures in the Lord of the Rings, each echoing a different aspect of the work of Christ. And so I'm calling my lectures, as you've heard, The Messiah Comes to Middle Earth, Images of Christ's Threefold Office in the Lord of the Rings, at the conclusion of his excellent book, The Philosophy of Tolkien, Peter Kreeft observes, there is no one con complete concrete visible Christ figure in the Lord of the Rings like Aslan in Narnia, but Christ is really, though invisibly, present in the whole of the Lord of the Rings. And perhaps this pervasive Christology helps explain the unique power of Tolkien's epic fantasy. The character of Christ is not a single thread in the story, but deeply woven into the entire narrative fabric. Indeed, is it possible for us to think of a book that more richly incarnates the themes of the gospel? As Crave continues, he tells us where to look for the real but invisible presence of Christ. He is more, more clearly present in Gandalf, Frodo, and Aragorn, the three Christ figures. First of all, all three undergo different forms of death and resurrection. Second, all three are saviors through self-sacrifice. They help save Middle Earth. And third, they exemplify the Old Testament threefold messianic symbolism of prophet, Gandalf, priest, Frodo, although I'm going to also talk about Frodo and Sam in my next lecture, and king, Aragorn. I want to explore some of these connections more deeply in these lectures. I want to think about how Tolkien can help us live out prophetical, sacerdotal, and regal dimensions of our own calling as Christians. And here are the th titles of the three lectures uh, that I will be giving over the next uh, several months. The first theologian to describe the work of Christ in terms of prophetic, priestly, and kingly ministry was Eusebius, the early 4th century bishop of Caesarea. He began his famous ecclesiastical history by defining the term Christ, or Messiah, or Anointed One, and concluding that this pertains to more than one Old Testament calling. It was not only those honored with the high priesthood, anointed with prepared oil, who were distinguished among the Hebrews with the name of Christ, but kings too, for they received the chrism from prophets and were made Christ's in image, bearing in themselves the patterns of kingly sovereign authority of the one true Christ who reigns over all. Again, some of the prophets, by chrism, by chrism meaning by anointing, became Christ's in pattern, so that they all stand in relation to the true Christ, the divine and heavenly word, who is the sole high priest of the universe, the sole king of all creation, and of the prophets, the sole arch prophet of the Father. And so these Old Testament prophets, priests, and kings, or priests, kings, and prophets, to use the order Eusebius uses, were images or patterns, but there is only one true Christ, and here is some of the praise that Eusebius offers him. He did not receive symbols and patterns of high priesthood from anyone. He did not trace his physical descent from the acknowledged priests. He was not promoted by soldiers' weapons to a kingdom or become a prophet in the same way as those of old. Yet, with all these, not indeed in symbols, but in very truth, he had been adorned by the Father. He is more entitled than any of them to be called Christ, being himself the one true Christ of God. Among the church fathers who followed Eusebius, 
We find occasional message, uh, mention of the threefold office. We find it, for example, in John Chrysostom, the golden-tongued preacher, who told his congregation in Constantinople that in old times, these three sorts were anointed, prophets and priests and kings, and then Chrysostom made a connection to Christian baptism. But we will have to wait until the Protestant Reformation, which we will consider in our next lecture, to see how this three-dimensional schema gets more fully developed in Christian doctrine. But in the meantime, I, I just want to mention for us all too briefly tonight that these church fathers were tapping into a rich vein of biblical truth. And we can illustrate this from prophetic ministry. From Moses to Malachi, the prophets performed miraculous signs and gave God's word to God's people, boldly speaking truth into the contemporary situation and foretelling the future. And this answered the people's need for guidance and deliverance. Each of the Old Testament prophets received a divine call for sacred ministry. Think of Moses at the burning bush, Isaiah in the temple, seeing the Lord high and lifted up. These men were not self-appointed, but sent by God, and on occasion, Elisha being the most notable example, they were anointed for this holy office with sacred oil. The prophets fulfilled their calling to communicate God's word, but they were not without their flaws. Moses striking the rock in sinful anger, Elijah running away from his calling, Jeremiah cursing the day that he was born. And as we consider the failings of these and other prophets, uh, careful students of the ancient scriptures, and this would, be, would have been true even in the Old Testament period and between the Testaments, people were looking in hope for God to fulfill the promise that he had made to raise up a prophet like Moses, one who would have God's very words in his mouth. Enter Jesus, the Christ, who in his singular person fulfilled the promise of all three offices. Here's how Richard Mao explains it. In ancient Israel's social economy, God developed three separate offices, prophet, priest, and king, along distinct and distinguishable lines. The roles and functions were separated for developmental preparatory purposes, but with the coming of the Christ, the offices are now gathered into an integral unity within one person. Here's how the English, Anglican bishop uh, John Henry Newman, before he converted to Catholicism, summarized the ways in which Christ fulfilled his threefold office. His, he fulfilled his prophetical office in teaching and in foretelling the future. And then Newman lists examples in his Sermon on the Mount, in his parables, in his prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem. He performed the priest's service when he died on the cross as a sacrifice. And now he intercedes for us at the right hand of God. And he showed himself as a king in rising from the dead, ascending to heaven, sending down the spirit of grace, converting the nations, and forming his church to receive and to rule them. To know our Savior in all of his offices is to know him in a more complete way. And so consider Christ in his prophetic office at the outset of his public ministry set apart as a prophet not by a mere anointing with oil but with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was on the basis of this divine chrism that Jesus read Isaiah's promise of a Messiah prophet, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, sat down with prophetic authority and announced today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And then in his own name and person, Jesus proceeded to preach the coming of the kingdom, to teach as no one had ever taught before with a kind of personal divine authority. He claimed a unique commission to speak on his father's behalf. And as prophet, he also performed miraculous signs and rebuked false teaching and made many predictions about his own death and resurrection and the final judgment and the end of the world. And as People observed all of this ministry. The crowd said, this is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. Now, with this biblical and Christological background in mind, uh, let's consider some of the ways in which Gandalf's coming to Middle Earth illuminates the ministry of anyone called to be a prophet. I do realize that Gandalf was a wizard and that Tolkien characterized him as an incarnate angel. I also, um, and, but 
I also want to say that Gandalf's, even Gandalf's appearance, his long white hair and sweeping silver beard, call to mind the venerable mien of some biblical prophet. Uh, here's an example. A lord of wisdom throned, he sat swift in anger, quick to laugh. An old man in a battered hat who leaned upon a thorny staff. He stood upon the bridge alone, and fire and shadow both defied. His staff was broken in the stone. In Khazad-dum, his wisdom died. Does anyone recognize that voice? It's uh, J.R.R. Tolkien. Uh, one of the benefits of uh, delivering these lectures, and I hope the word gets out among Wheaton College faculty, is the opportunity to experience some of the treasures of the Wade Collection. I, I want to thank not only Marge Mead for uh, making the invitation and setting up this series, but also Laura Schmidt, who really put together all of the visuals uh, that you'll see tonight. Just very grateful for the uh, partnership and collaboration, which was really the intent of this uh, lecture series that we would work together to, to share an evening like this. Readers and moviegoers alike will remember Gandalf's stubborn reluctance to part with his old man's walking stick at the Hall of Theoden. And I'm not going to do a lot of movie clips tonight, but I couldn't resist this one. Gustav. You would not part an old man from his walking stick. <laughs> and it was with good reason that he refused to give up his walking stick because like Moses and Elisha, he used it to perform miraculous signs and wonders. Back in the Shire, Gandalf used this power primarily for amusement. I didn't realize that was, uh, this is nice that the images actually move there. I didn't realize that. That's great. <laughs> you get the full effect. Uh, his fame among the hobbits in the Shire was due mainly, I'm quoting from the, Lord, uh, from the Fellowship of the Ring, due mainly to his skill with fires, smokes, and lights. But when trouble came, the old wizard could do a lot more than set off some fireworks. Uh, you may remember how Frodo crosses into Rivendell at the Ford of Bruin, and mighty waters miraculously sweep away the Black Riders, and Gandalf modestly admits that he added a few touches of his own, waves that took the form of great white horses with shining white riders. He used his miraculous powers in times of grave danger, when, uh, the, for example, the wizard bravely rode out of Minas Tirith to, to fend off uh, the winged Nazgul long enough for Faramir and his men to reach the safety of the city gates. When Pippin saw the black riders, he shouted, ah, I cannot stand it. Gandalf, Gandalf, save us. Then he saw the wizard riding out to meet the pressing danger. He shouted even more wildly, Gandalf, Gandalf, he always turns up when things are darkest. Go on, go on, white rider. Yet the wizard's influence lay chiefly in the domain of wisdom, shaping the affairs of Middle-earth by the power of his words. According to the Silmarillion, the legendary writings that provide the deep background for the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf and the other wizards were messengers sent by the lords of the West to contest the power of Sauron. The word messenger indicating that they did not confront evil through military strength, but with the power of truth. Frodo and his friends depend mainly on Gandalf the Grey, the chief counselor and guide of those who work for the overthrow of the enemy. Frodo did not set out for the Shire until Gandalf counseled him to do so. For until then, we are told, the wizard had not at that time appeared or sent any message for several years. It's like Israel between the Testaments, uh, the Shire waiting for a prophetic word. When Gandalf finally does speak, he advises Frodo as to which course he should take. He sets in motion the events that would save Middle-earth. And once the fellowship is formed, he serves as the guide. And this is his reason for going along on Frodo's quest. I do not know if I can do anything to help you, he tells the brave hobbit, but I will whisper in your ears. When the company falters at the doors of Moria, it is Gandalf who leads them into the deep mines and guides them through dark and deadly paths. And at a moment of doubt, when they seem to have lost their way, Aragorn says to the others, do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
I've been with him on many a journey, if never on one so dark. And there are tales of Rivendell of greater deeds of his than any that I have seen. He will not go astray if there is any path to find. He has led us in here against our fears, but he'll lead us out again at whatever cost to himself. So this is one of the things you can do if you don't have an English accent. You can uh, get quotes from somebody who does. So, <laughs> Once Gandalf is dragged into the abyss, it is his wise guidance that Frodo and his fellow travelers miss most of all. As they lament his loss in the months afterwards, they, they often wonder what counsel would Gandalf give in this situation or that situation. It happens at the Black Gate when Frodo finds there is no way into Mordor. And Gollum offers to lead him up dangerous stairs. There Frodo sat upon the ground for a long while, silent, his head bowed, striving to recall all that Gandalf had said to him. But for this choice, he could recall no counsel. Indeed, Gandalf's guidance had been taken from them too soon, too soon. Guidance for choices is not the only help Gandalf has to give. Like the biblical prophets, he foresees the future. According to Treebeard, this is the business of wizards. They are always troubled about the future. Perhaps the most significant example is his true prophecy that before the quest could be completed, Gollum would fulfill some vital role. Gandalf's heart told him this. And in, in the event, Frodo remembers the wizard's prophecy and says, but do you remember Gandalf's words? Even Gollum may have something yet to do, but for him, Sam, I could not have destroyed the ring. The quest would have been in vain, even at the bitter end. More than telling the future, Gandalf sees the present in true perspective, and this too is a prophetic gift. The biblical prophets may be best known for predictive prophecies, but the preponderance of their ministry involves speaking uncomfortable truths about the present situation. Gandalf first offers the gift of discerning the times to Frodo when he is still at Bag End, back home in the Shire. As the wizard carefully explains the rise of the shadow, the unique power of the one great ring, the wider state of affairs in Middle-earth, Frodo wishes none of these things had transpired in his own time. So do I, Gandalf replies, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to do is what to do with the time that is given to us. Now, it's not surprising that Gandalf's words, prophetic and otherwise, sometimes fall on deaf ears. This is the sad fate of prophets everywhere who are, not, who are rarely treated with honor, either in their own town or elsewhere. In Rohan, Gandalf is regarded as a harbinger of bad news. Gandalf Stormcrow, the king calls him, a bringer of evil, a herald of woe. In Gondor, Lord Denethor makes similar complaints about his unwelcome habit of coming to him with tidings of grief and danger. Some have accused you, Denethor says, of delighting to bear ill news. Part of Gandalf's rejoinder is that he only comes when help is needed. Yet in two ways may a man come with evil tidings, he says to King Theoden. He may be a worker of evil or he may be such as leaves well alone and comes only to bring aid in time of need. Besides, the bad news that Gandalf brings happens to be true news that needs to be heard. Bilbo, who on occasion accused Gandalf of being an interfering old busybody, later observes that although the wizard almost never gives pleasant advice, it always turns out to be good advice, maybe the wisdom of prophets only seems wise to the wise. In the end, it is Gandalf's wise words more than anything else that win the victory over the black powers of mortar. He has been the mover of all that has been accomplished, says Oregon, Aragorn. This is his victory. In his summary of the rings of power and the third age, which is published as part of the Silmarillion, Tolkien concludes by saying, now all these things were achieved for the most part by the counsel and vigilance of Mithrandir. Even when Gandalf rode into battle, words were his primary weapon. You cannot pass, or his similar rebuke when the Lord of the Nazgul broke down the gate of Gondor and sought to capture the city. You cannot enter here. Go back to the abyss prepared for you. Go back. Fall into the nothingness that awaits you and your master. Go. And he gives a similar 
rebuke to the messenger of mortar at the black gate, Moranon. As, as for your terms, we reject them utterly. Get you gone, for your embassy is over and death is near to you. We did not come here to waste words with one of Sauron's slaves. Be gone. Much more could be said about Gandalf's wise words, words of war warning, interpretation of dreams, unfolding of ancient mysteries, answers to curious questions. But all of this, I think, highlights a crucial principle of Gandalf's rules of engagement. He has the freedom to give counsel, and in moments of danger, he is permitted to rescue those who are in peril, but he is not permitted to exercise mastery over lesser creatures or gain victory by means of superior strength. And we know this from one of Tolkien's letters, in which he explains that the wizards were sent to train, advise, instruct, arouse the hearts and minds of those threatened to a resistance with their own strengths and not just to do the job for them. Similarly, in one of his long appendices, he loved long appendices to things, um, they were messengers sent to contest the power of Sauron, but they were forbidden to match his power with power or to seek to dominate elves or men by force and fear. Maybe the clearest example of this commission comes in the long conversation with Frodo at the beginning of the trilogy. Uh, Frodo's beginning to grasp the dangers of the ring. He wishes it had never been found. Why did you let me keep it, he asks. Why didn't you make me throw it away or destroy it? Let you, Gandalf says, make you. Haven't you been listening to all that I have said? And later when Frodo insists that he was not made for perilous quests and asks the wizard to take the ring. He, Gandalf springs to his feet, renounces the temptation to gain any more power than he already has. The decision lies with you, he says to Frodo, but I will always help you. The guidance Gandalf gives is never coercive, but always respecting the free choice of other creatures. One limitation he does not face is mortality. The wizards do not die, but go on living in Middle-earth from age to age. And yet, Tolkien contrives to have Gandalf pass through a sequence of death, resurrection, and transfiguration. This is one of the most, I think, deeply Christian aspects of what Tolkien accomplishes in The Lord of the Rings. Each of his three main protagonists, as we'll see over the course of these lectures, lays down his life only to take it up again and then become immortal. Gandalf meets his quote-unquote death, I say quote-unquote, although Tolkien in one of his letters says Gandalf died. I mean, he, Tolkien himself put this in terms of a, a death and resurrection experience. Uh, he faces the Balrog. He's never faced this evil presence before. And according to Tolkien, this again from one of his letters, it was truly a sacrifice for Gandalf to perish on the bridge in defense of his companions. It was nothing less than a humbling and abnegation of himself because for all he could know at that moment, he was the only person who could direct the resistance to Sauron successfully and therefore at that moment in giving himself up, his mission was in vain. He was giving up all personal hope of success. It was a complete sacrifice. His traveling companions grieve deeply believing that they will never see him again, and also uh, knowing that the loss of his aid threatens their very survival. But Gandalf was not dead after all, because after he sacrificed himself, he was, in Tolkien's words, accepted and enhanced and returned. This is the description from one of his letters. Once he was reunited with Aragorn, Gimli, and Legolas, the Wizard described his mysterious journey. Long he fell in the, into fire and then into deep water where all was dark. Yet even Moria's virtual tomb turned out to have a bottom beyond light and knowledge where the world is gnawed by nameless things. And there Gandalf wrestled against the deadly beast until coming to an endless stair that went from the lowest dungeon to the highest peak. And there on a pinnacle of fire and ice, Gandalf threw down his ancient enemy. Then darkness took me, he told his friends, and I strayed out of thought and time and wandered far on roads that I will not tell. This was Gandalf's passage through the underworld. Upon his return, his friends saw him as an old man and failed at first to recognize him. 
It's reminiscent, is it not, of the first resurrection appearances of Jesus Christ, Gandalf veiled from their sight. But suddenly they knew him for who he was. They saw his dazzling splendor. His hair was white as snow in the sunshine, and gleaming white was his robe. The eyes under his deep brows were bright, piercing as the rays of the sun. Power was in his hand. It sounds almost like things that we read in Revelation. Gandalf the Grey has become Gandalf the White. And when Aragorn saw him shining as if with some light kindled within, he said, we have one mightier than the nine riders of the Dark Lord. We have the White Rider. He has passed through the fire and the abyss, and they shall fear him. We will go where he leads. Do you remember Gimli's encomium? Paralleling the gospel even more closely, Gandalf's head is now sacred, he says. And later when Gandalf confronts Saruman at the Tower of Orthanc, he says, Behold, I am not Gandalf the Grey, whom you betrayed. I am Gandalf the, the White, who has returned from death. And so Gandalf has become, like Christ, a prophet who died and rose again. His Transformation, indeed his transfiguration, gives fresh, fresh courage to the free people of Middle-earth. The most famous response comes from Samwise Gamgee. Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? One of the high purposes of fantasy, and Dr. Hansen reminded us of this uh, so beautifully this evening, is to help us live more wisely in reality. Indeed, C.S. Lewis took this to be one of the main things that Tolkien wants to say, that the real life of men is of mythical and heroic quality. The value of myth, Lewis goes on to say, is that it takes all the things we know and restores them to them the rich significance which has been hidden by the veil of familiarity. Uh, this was from Lewis's review of the Lord of Rings. Well, the Lord of the Rings, well worth reading. So, what might we be able to learn from Gandalf's ministry as prophet? And part of my reason for asking is personal, because I think the role of prophet, also priest and king, is part of my calling as the president of a Christ-centered college. That's what I've been thinking about, and what I wanted to bring into conversation with one of the Wade authors. I'm looking, frankly, for all the help I can get, and. Uh, one good place uh, to find it is in the threefold office of Christ. This idea has a long but forgotten history in American higher education. In his History of Divinity at Harvard College, George Hunston Williams shows that Charles Chauncey, Increase Mather, other presidents from Harvard's earliest decades viewed their office in continuity with Elijah and Elisha. In effect, they were leading the school of the prophets in colonial America. And thus the president of Harvard was a prophet, although in their understanding he was not a priest or a king. Here's Charles Chauncey that takes you back to an era, doesn't it? According to Hunston Williams, the association of the prophetic office with the academy had an even deeper history of imparting a kind of Christian sanction to university education. Um, even going back uh, into the 13th century, uh, Alexander of Rose distinguished the prophetic calling of the academy from the priestly calling of the church and the kingly calling of government. And these distinctions were dramatized across the New England landscape by towns that featured a school, a church, and a town hall on their commons. The school was the prophet, the church was the priest, the town hall was the king. That's a schema that makes sense, I think. But I also happen to think that a college president fulfills all three offices, and I need to recognize all three of these dimensions um, in my own work. And I will explain more so and more clearly in my next lecture that every Christian is called to be a prophet, a priest, and a king. It's true for fathers and mothers, for do uh, doctors and lawyers, scholars and teachers, busboys and businessmen, even students and roommates. According to our various callings, we all have some responsibility to speak true words, to offer sacrificial service, to show empowered leadership. And so I think the question, what can we learn from Gandalf's ministry as prophet, is relevant for all of us. It's very much in keeping with the purposes of these lectures, which is to bring our, our 
faculty thinking into conversation with these authors we honor at the Wade Center. But I first need to ask this question, is this way of reading The Lord of the Rings even legitimate? Some of you may have been having that question already this evening, and there are a lot of reasons to be cautious. Even a brief survey of literary criticism on The Lord of the Rings shows that a lot of Christian scholars have tried their hand at Tolkien's magnum opus, and there's such an abundant variety of approaches, it, it warns us to be a little careful about claims we make for any particular perspective. I'm not giving you the only reading of Tolkien, um, even the only Christian reading, but I am giving you a reading. I also want to acknowledge that Tolkien has a lot of pagan as well as Christian influences. In fact, I think it's best to say that the imaginative world we enter when we read The Lord of the Rings is pre-Christian. And as Tolkien thought about it, Middle Earth is not a different world, it's our own world at a different time, and that time is clearly a time before Christ. Here's how uh, Tolkien described it in one of his letters. The fall of man is in the past, but it's off stage. The redemption of man, capital R, capital M, is in the far future. This helps to explain why uh, Tolkien told W.H. Auden that he did not feel under any obligation to make the story fit with formalized Christianity. To put anything explicitly Christian into the story would have been anachronistic. It also would have been contra contrary to Tolkien's sensibilities as an author. His antipathy to allegory is well known. Now I'm, I'll, you'll understand why I'm talking about allegory and applicability in a few moments, but this is kind of the section of the talk that I'm in. In his foreword to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings, the author wrote, as for any inner meaning or message, it has in the intention of the author none. It is neither allegorical nor topical. I cordially dislike allegory in all its manifestations and have always done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. Given these comments, isn't it something of a surprise to learn how carefully Tolkien selected the date for Sauron's downfall? The ring was destroyed on March 25th, which happens to be the traditional date for the Annunciation, nine months before Christmas, and also for the crucifixion. As it happens this year, uh, Laura knows a lot of things, uh, kindly informed me that March 25 is Good Friday this year. Also, some of you will know, uh, does anybody know the date on which the fellowship sets out from Rivendell? December 25th. Um, as a practicing Catholic, Tolkien was more than familiar with this tradition, and he was as interested in chronology almost as he was in etymology, and evidently chose this date to present his narrative as a forerunner to the gospel. And indeed, in a brief essay entitled Nomenclature of the Lord of the Rings, Tolkien confides with his readers that March 25 was intentionally chosen by me. But what is far more significant is the way Christian themes pervade Tolkien's narrative world. So that the Lord of the Rings trilogy, this is how the novelist Michael O'Brien describes it, is irradiated by the unspoken, unseen presence of Christ. And I think Tolkien would agree with that. On more than one occasion, he admitted that the more life a story has, and I ask you, what story has more life than the Lord of the Rings? the more readily its readers will draw connections to their convictions or interpret its meaning in ways that reinforce their own beliefs. He also believed deeply in his calling as a, a what he called a sub-creator, a creature who imitates his creator in making new worlds. And these worlds, Tolkien realized, inevitably reflect the character of the author. It is, suppose, impossible, I suppose, impossible, Tolkien confided to W.H. Auden, to write any story that is not allegorical in proportion as it comes to life, since each of us is an allegory embodying in a particular tale and clothed in the garments of time and place universal truth and everlasting life. The story any sub-creator writes also reflects in turn the character of God as creator. And so in conversation with Clyde S. Kilby, Tolkien claimed that God is the Lord of angels and of man and of elves, legend and history have met and fused, end quote. And if that's true, then the whole imaginative world of Middle Earth is under the Lordship of Christ. It's not outside of that Lordship. 
And this principle of sub-creation explains why, despite his protests against any explicit Christian meaning, Tolkien could also say to a correspondent, I am a Christian, which can be deduced from my stories, and in fact, a Roman Catholic. I don't think there's a contradiction here. I think what we see instead is Tolkien's, and this was Dr. Kilby's word for it, contrasistency. Um, that's something you might want to try out anytime somebody accuses you of some kind of, con oh, that's not a contradiction, I'm just being contrasistent. Um, <laughs> In another letter, Tolkien wrote, The Lord of the Rings is, of course, a fundamentally religious and Catholic work. Unconsciously so at first, but consciously in the revision. I have cut out practically all references to anything like religion, to cults and practices in the imaginary world. For the religious element is absorbed into the story and the symbolism. I wonder if this is a way to say it, that the Lord in The Lord of the Rings... Christianity, in effect, becomes incarnate. It becomes incarnate in, in the story that Tolkien tells. And if he's right, if Christianity is absorbed into a story, I think we should expect to find Christ present in many places, not allegorically where this thing lines up with that thing, but inherently, including in the character of Gandalf. That's not to suggest Tolkien had all of the connections I've mentioned in mind. Clearly, uh, clearly he did not. For him, the mere stories were the thing. They arose in my mind as given things, yet I always I had the sense of recording what was already there somewhere, not of inventing. But Tolkien also came to understand that in what he called a closely woven story, now I'm quoting from one of his letters, allegory and story converge meeting somewhere in truth. And all of that means, I think, that whatever his intentions as a writer, people who enter the world of his stories naturally find connections with their own world. And I think it explains why Tolkien drew a distinction between allegory, which, as I've noted, he sometimes talked about disliking, and applicability, which he positively encouraged. Here's, this is from the foreword to the second edition of The Lord of the Rings. I, I think that many confuse applicability with allegory, but the one resides in the freedom of the reader and the other in the purposed domination of the author. I'm exercising my freedom as a reader of applicability <laughs> and uh, wanting to give just uh, a few lessons. This is the end of my talk, um, and then Dr. Richter will come up for a brief response. Here are several lessons that college presidents and others, including other leaders, can draw from Gandalf and apply to the prophetic dimension of our own calling. Gandalf teaches us not to be afraid to say what needs to be said, even in the face of opposition. Prophets speak the truth according to circumstance. And there is a time to encourage, but also a time to correct, a time to warn, as well as a time to console. And so a prophet's words are not always welcome. Indeed, Jesus was mocked in his prophetic office right up until his crucifixion, his tormentors spitting in his face, slapping him, and saying, Prophesy to us, you Christ, who is it that struck you? And yet Jesus continued to speak the truth, using his very cross as a pulpit. And so too, when we are called to speak the truth, we should speak it forthrightly as Jesus did, as Gandalf did, to both friends and enemies. Gandalf also teaches us to beware of the temptations that come with greater power and growing influence. The wizard is a person of immense power, which he is not afraid to use, especially when his friends are in danger. But he steadfastly resists any temptation to use this power for his own purposes, even when he is pressed to do so. And so he dismisses Saruman's invitation to become co-regent of Middle-earth. He refuses outright when Frodo offers him the one ring of power. I do not trust myself in this, he tells Lord Denethor, so I refused this thing, even as a freely given gift. His healthy mistrust of his own strength to handle more power than he should have preserves the purity of his prophetic voice. Here's another lesson to apply, closely related. We should not use our words to coerce people, but instead we should respect their God-given freedom to make their own choices in life. I think this lesson is especially important for parents, teachers, pastors, counselors, anyone given the care of souls. 
We need to be careful not to play God for other people. And even if we know the truth as Gandalf did, we need to respect the freedom of others to draw their own conclusions, to make their own choices, even if some of those choices and conclusions seem wrong to us. Gandalf was careful to obey the rules of his calling, and one of the rules for us is not to make decisions for other people or manipulate them to make the decisions we think they ought to make. This principle is hard for people who want to see the Christian college play a parental role and don't always like the decisions that students make or faculty make or administrators make for that matter. Tolkien rightly understood that evil and the enemy are the ones who want to dictate and dominate. Our role is to guide and educate. It's a prophetic role that gives the members of our community broad freedom to make their own decisions. Finally, Gandalf teaches us to speak words of hope in desperate times. The influence of Christianity seems to be declining in these parts anyway, and at the same time, opposition to Christianity is increasing, not only here, but around the world, and it has made some Christians pessimistic about the future. Many can relate to the words of Aragorn, so we come to it in the end, the great battle of our time in which many things shall pass away. Or we might take up Theoden's lament, alas, that these evil days should be mine and should come in my old age instead of that peace which I have earned. But fortunately for Theoden king and his followers, Gandalf was there to correct his royal self-pity and strengthen his manly courage. The wizard called the old king to cast aside regret and fear and do the deed at hand which Theoden did. Gandalf's good words often had a life-giving effect on people. During Gondor's last defense, it was said that wherever he came, men's hearts would lift again. That's, that's what leaders do. They strengthen people's souls. And that, that takes more than discerning the times or even knowing what needs to be done. It, it also takes wisdom to give people the courage to face what they must. Like the free peoples of Middle Earth, we live at a time when all realms shall be put to the test to stand or fall under the shadow. But don't Christians always live in such times as we will wait for the return of our king? God has given us the ministry of prophets, not only to help us discern the times, but also to give us the strength to persevere. And we must do our part in our time. As Gandalf explained to Aragorn, and these will be the last words. Other evils there are that may come, for Sauron is himself but a servant or emissary. Yet it is not our part to muster all the tides of the world, but to do what is in us for the succor of those years wherein we are set, uprooting the evil in the fields that we know, so that those who live after may have clean earth to till. Anticipation to the next two lectures in the series, um, early February and at the end of March. There'll be more information on our website. I assume most of you are on our email list because you're here tonight, but if not, just mention it at the front desk as you leave. Um, we are especially grateful to have as respondent this evening Dr. Sandra Richter, professor of Old Testament at Wheaton College. Dr. Richter is a graduate of Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary and Harvard University. A gifted teacher, Dr. Richter is passionate about bringing the Old Testament to life by helping those studying what she terms the great narrative of God and his people. I like that. Better understand and experience the reality of Old Testament life through a closer look at the history, archaeology, geography, and even the languages of the ancient Near East. Because of Dr. Richter's expertise and understanding of the Old Testament prophetic role, 
We have invited her to offer some brief remarks in response to Dr. Riken's words on the prophetic ministry of Gandalf the Grey. Now, following Dr. Richter's remarks, we will take a very short break to set up for the Q&A time. Um, I encourage you to stay and participate in that. There will also be a reception following in which you would have an opportunity to talk with both Dr. Riken and Dr. Richter and talk amongst yourselves as well. But if you do need to slip out following Dr. Richter's remarks would be a good time to do so. Thank you. And thank you, President Riken. It really is a, a joy and a privilege to be here responding to this paper. For in spite of the standard tidal wave of end of the semester responsibilities and publishing deadlines and professional meetings next week, I could hardly decline this invitation. And not merely for the obvious reason that this stellar fellow happens to be my boss. <laughs> But because, if you know me well, you know that there are only two stories that I know better than my own. Two narratives in which I can say I've wrapped my life and that I can further say with some confidence have made me better than I am. These epic tales sang a new song to this broken heart and have over and over again given me the courage and the vision to pursue a life beyond status quo, a dream beyond the darkness. The most influential of these, of course, is the great story. The story of redemption, the ongoing saga of a heavenly father who cannot, will not rest until he seeks and saves his own. The story of a God who stands at the gate of death and says, let my people go. This is the most influential of the two, but it's not the first. Rather, I would say that the first gospel I ever heard was that of a king exiled from his throne. One who, although the heir of Numenor had taken the form of a vagabond and being found in the appearance of a ranger, lived out his life on the margins of his own lawful inheritance, tirelessly laboring to undermine the enemy that held his citizenry captive, who regardless of the cost strove without ceasing to seek and save a kingdom that seemed destined only for decline and defeat all for the sake of a populace who had no idea who he truly was. This, of course, is Aragorn, the son of Aaron Thorn, Elendil's heir. And it was this man and his fellows, Frodo the Nine Fingers and Gandalf the White, who prepared this heart to hear the story of another king. Destined to rule, whose outward appearance gave no hint of his royal lineage, but in truth was the heir and the prince of the kingdom of God. All said, the chance to bring these stories together into one here this evening at this event is one I couldn't turn down and I'm deeply privileged to do. So as we've heard tonight, President Riken's thesis is that I'm not the only one who has heard the gospel and met the king in the epic tale of the Lord of the Rings. Moreover, he has detailed that the threefold office of the Christ can be located in these three great heroes of the saga of Middle Earth. Aragorn the king, Frodo the priest, and Gandalf the prophet. And President Riken has launched these Hansen lectures with the prophet, Gandalf the Grey. So our first question, of course, is whence this threefold office of the Christ that President Riken is utilizing as an analog for the threefold ministry of the college president and indeed the calling of every Christian? The obvious answer, as affirmed by every writer of the New Testament, is that this threefold office of the Christ emerges from the threefold office of the theocracy of ancient Israel. The analog is first alluded to in the opening genealogy of the Gospel of Matthew, and it's brought to its climax by the author of Hebrews. Indeed, the threefold theocracy of God's kingdom is one of the core types of Old and New Testament theology. So what is a theocracy? The word itself emerges from the Greek word for God, theos, and to rule, kratel, and it communicates the nature of ancient Israel's actual federal government. Yahweh actually ruled Israel, enthroned above the cherubim from his palace known in the Old Testament as the Beit Yahweh, making Israel the actual kingdom of God. So in Israel, unlike Puritan or modern America, 
the enemies of the state were in truth the enemies of God. The national borders of the state were the actual boundaries of the kingdom of God, and the citizens of the state were actual members of the kingdom of God. But who would rule this divinely directed kingdom? Yahweh was, of course, the great king, offering regular audience to his people. He sanctioned and directed holy war and received tribute and taxation from his citizenry. But who carried out his wishes in the everyday realities of running the society? The answer to this is found in the constitution of the nation, the book of Deuteronomy. Here in chapters 16 through 18, we find the job descriptions of these three human officers of Yahweh's government, the prophet, the priest, and the king. As I teach in my introduction to Old Testament classes, the prophet spoke for God to the people. The priest spoke for the people to God. And the king was the civic leader and steward of Yahweh's kingdom. Now, being ourselves the heirs of monarchy, we naturally assume that the king was the most powerful of these three officers. But we assume wrongly, as Israel often did as well. It was in reality the prophet as the heir of Moses and Yahweh's representative to his vassal nation, who carried the most authority in Israel's government. The true prophet was indeed the mouth of Yahweh. He was the king maker and the king breaker and all authority. Well, let me say it this way. His authority reigned supreme. Nowhere in is this dynamic demonstrated more eloquently than the prophet Nathan's confrontation of King David in 2 Samuel 12. Here David, the paradigmatic king of all Israel, has been found guilty of adultery, fraud, conspiracy, and murder. He's rewarded one of his mighty men with the most despicable betrayals of trust, sending a loyal and courageous man to his death in order to cover David's own crimes. Such an ugly story. And as David sits enthroned in his palace, elevated above his citizenry, dressed as a royal, insulated against the agonies of regular life by his wealth and his influence, with his armed men lining the walls of his audience chamber, Nathan enters unarmed. I can only see Gandalf and Theoden here. And Nathan cries out from the floor in public in front of David's own enlisted men, you are the man. You stole, you cheated, you lied. That woman is not your own and that child will die. I assure you that in any other courtroom in the ancient Near East, that prophet would have died where he stood, but not in Yahweh's kingdom. For when the prophet spoke in Israel, God spoke and wise kings listened. And so are Gandalf, without summons, without license, without a weapon, okay, a staff, but not a weapon. <laughs> Gandalf speaks, demons tremble, and the king obeys. As Dr. Riken has demonstrated, like the prophet of Israel, Gandalf counsels kings with a wisdom that ultimately emanates from another kingdom, one beyond the ken or experience of the limited vision of the human kings of Rohan, Gondor, and beyond. The wizards are instead, as President Riken has said, messengers sent by the lords of the West to contest the power of Sauron. In their darkest days, these human kings turn, willingly or not, to hear the wisdom of a singular cause that is above their own, a cause that, if secured, will deliver all of them from the greatest of threats. Moreover, unlike these human kings, Gandalf sees the true enemy. He discerns his influence in places others may not, and he stands by steadfast as first Frodo, and then Aragorn, Elrond, and Theoden, Faramir and Treebird, each in turn are overcome by their circumstances, terrified by their opponents, unsure of their own strength, and they waver. Like King Hezekiah, each of these cry out in their moment of fear, this is a day of distress and rebuke and rejection. Children have come to the point of birth, but there's no strength to deliver, Isaiah 37. But like Isaiah, Gandalf steps to the fore, seizes the hand that trembles and shouts out, take your stand, hold your ground. If you believe you'll live, Yahweh will defend this city and save it for his own sake and the sake of his servant, David. And so Gandalf, the eyes and the voice of the Eldar, hmm, stands at Aragorn's side, 
in that darkest of days at the entrance of the Black Gate, outarmed, outmanned, standing in the heart of the enemy's territory, Gandalf speaks truth into Aragorn's soul. It is Gandalf's vision that gives Aragorn the strength to stand before his quaking troops and declare, sons of Gondor, of Rohan, my brothers, I see in your eyes the same fear that would take the heart of me. A day may come when the courage of men fails, when we forsake our friends and break all bonds of fellowship, but this is not that day. This day we fight. By all that you hold dear on this good earth, I bid you stand, men of the West. And they do. Now, all of us who know the story know that by strength of arms, Aragorn doesn't stand a chance. Unless a power beyond their reach acts, Aragorn and the men of the West, who stand as martyrs at the gate of Mordor, will die. And we all know it. But a power beyond their reach does act. And just like Hezekiah, standing on the walls of besieged Jerusalem, the impossible happens. The Dark Lord retreats, his sword is broken, and the king lives to fight another day. What did a true prophet do in the Old Testament? Well, like Gandalf, he saw the world as it actually was. He came as the emissary of the true king and brought words of vision and wisdom, courage and hope to a constituency who for so many reasons could not see. The prophet brought the aroma of life to a world overcome with the stench of death. And he spoke the truth, regardless of how costly it might be. The parallels here to a Christian leader, specifically to a college president, are obvious and are daunting. Of all the parallels I could affirm or expand upon based on President Riken's paper, the one I'm most eager to make comes from his final paragraphs. As he states, is this not what good leaders do? Is this not what good leaders do? They strengthen people's souls. They strengthen people's souls for what? I would say to fulfill their true vocations. The prophet, privy to the divine counsel of heaven, actually saw the plan of the Almighty. And speaking to kings or commoners, the prophet brought that vision into reality. As Dr. Reichen has said, Gandalf saw those he served with an uncommon vision. He saw in an everyday hobbit a hero of uncommon courage. He saw in an antiquated ent a critical ally. He identified the peripheral and the essential, and he told Theoden to do the same. He allied dwarves and elves and hobbits and men under a single banner. He urged them to resist the all-consuming objective of defending their own turf, and he convinced them to throw their shoulders behind a single wheel, the imperative of the calling of the kingdom. In sum, the true prophet spent his life empowering those around him to be great so that the kingdom might prevail and the true enemy might be crushed. And as I, a simple hobbit, with a divinely ordained calling, look to my president, I say, Godspeed, President Riken. We need you. We need your vision. We need your courage. We need you. Thank you. All right, we're starting. Yes, we are. Um, I have the privilege of tossing the first question, and you all have the privilege and responsibility to keep the conversation rolling. Uh, this microphone is uh, for your questions so that it will be taped and recorded um, for the Wade Center. So please bring your questions to the mic. And as I tell my students all the time, if you're thinking it, so is someone else. So don't be shy. Uh, so my first question, uh, Dr. Riken, is you speak of coercion 
as a great temptation to those in power. Where do you find the boundary between influence and coercion and authority in your own leadership? Yeah, so it's something to strive for, isn't it? First of all, I just, I mean, your remarks were tremendous, um, Dr. Richter. If you're wondering, like, what's the quality of instruction in Bible and theology at Wheaton College, you had a just really great chance to see that tonight. And also, I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that if, if you're on the right track with an idea, somebody else can take that idea and go farther with it. And so there were just fresh insights there in how prophets relate to kings, prophetic work, and that encourages me to think this is a really good way to think about uh, the Lord of the Rings. So, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, striving after balance in influence but not coercion. So one thing I always like to know is who is the decision maker in this discussion? Because it should be clear to everyone in the discussion okay, we're deciding this together, or we're not deciding this together, but this person is deciding it. That helps you realize in the discussion, what part do I play? So am I somebody that gives counsel or advice? Am I actually receiving advice to make a decision? And so one of the ways we get into trouble is when we think a decision isn't, is ours when it really isn't, mm -hmm. and that's when we try to take more influence over a situation than we should. Mm -hmm. Another thing that to me is very important in leadership is I like to think carefully about what the process is more so than what the outcome is. So if you already have the outcome in mind and you, you say, I've got to have this decision out of this discussion, then it's tempting to work the discussion, work the process to your end, which is very different from saying, what's a good way for us to discuss this issue? Who, who should have input into this deliberation? Um, what's a good time for us to allow to talk about these things? Should we, you know, would it be good for us to have a discussion about it now and then come back to it a week later and then make it? A, those kinds of things are very important for not being coercive and manipulative in a, particularly in a leadership um, decision making process. And then I think having a discussion where you actually have all the issues on the table. So it's helpful if you have a discussion. It seems like everybody is kind of going along with the decision, but then that's a good place for a leader to say, now I've only heard people speak in support of this, but there must be, there, ha there has to be some reason why we might want to be careful about not doing this. So there must be somebody here that has a question or concern about this. And even opening up that space in a conversation then gives people the freedom to put an alternative perspective into the conversation. If you're very concerned about getting the exactly the outcome that you wanted, then you don't want to hear those voices because they might lead in a different direction. So I think all of those things, the process, how you think about the outcome, all of those things fall in, to me into the category of being careful about coercion. Hmm. Hmm. I'm going to keep asking these questions. Somebody get up. Yeah. Someone Somebody help emerges us out. here. We're coming. I'm, and I'm just going to tag, when the coercion question comes up, I'm thinking, one thing I'm thinking in particular is, um, Dr. Reichen, you are such, you are the type man of Wheaton College. I don't know if you know that. Um, you are the, and especially in our students' eyes, you are the embodiment of the ideal Wheaty. Um, <laughs> Which is, to some degree, is true at most institutions. The president is a kind of living logo for the institution. Mm -hmm. If the president can't be that, you maybe didn't choose the right president mm -hmm. for your school. <laughs> So. But I'm thinking of how many conversations you must have with students every day where they want you to step in and make their decisions and they see you as a messiah come to Middle Earth. And, um, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, another one thing in personal conversations where people are asking you to do something to help them solve their problem. Um, although, actually, the temptation you're talking about is a bigger temptation for parents than for students. Um, because, of course, you're the president. You can solve whatever their issue is with the college. Um, just asking the question, how do you think I might be able to help you? Or what are you asking me to do? Hmm. Is a really important one. Because a lot of times, I'll be th I like to solve problems. So I'll be thinking, oh, you know, how can I solve this problem? Or, ooh, I don't I'm not going to be able to solve this problem. This person's not going to be happy with me because I'm not going to be able to. But even asking the question and putting it in the conversation, what, 
what are you asking me to do or how do you think I can help you? That often helps set up realistic expectations for what the relationship is and what you can or can't do. And I didn't mean to interrupt. We have, yes. Sure, I'll jump in. So listen, thank you very much. That was wonderful. Um, really kind of two, two comments that, that maybe you could comment on. But um, one, I appreciated that you didn't automatically go, that you started with profit, that you sort of start out having this discussion between profit and, um, and then uh, versus the Messiah. Because oftentimes we go, we see Gandalf, or we see other characters, and we go straight to the Messiah, right? And so you're drawing out the prophet. Um, so I really appreciate you doing that. And then secondly, I find it interesting in this um, discussion then of the wizard, because um, in looking at the Reformation, and first, uh, when you look at uh, some of the reformers, especially the radical reformers, the Anabaptists, they were um, saw themselves in that prophetic role, but also people accused them of wizards. And they got caught up in killing them in the same way with, as witches. Hmm. Um, so which is just interesting in that um, they were sort of misunderstood, um, perhaps I would want to say there. Um, and so I wondered sort of some of those connections with um, Tolkien as well as looking at prophet um, versus wizard. Because as you're going through there and sort of describing um, the role of prophet and uh, some of their, their um, sort of attitudes and postures, I really saw a lot of the reformers there and some of the radical reformers there, that, some of the Anabaptists. So I uh, just found that interesting if, if you want to make So a couple of comments on that. First of all, I think one of the things that gives the Lord of the Rings its unique power is you don't have the weight of everything that a Messiah could be resting on a single character in the story. I think that's one of the things that makes the Lord of the Rings non-allegorical. You don't have one Christ figure. I mean. So, I mean, Narnia Chronicles, you do. Aslan is that. So I'm not saying that's the wrong way to write a story. But I think Lord of the Rings has more depth in a different way because of the way you get different perspectives and, and a, a fuller picture emerges of everything that, that uh, a Messiah accomplishes. So that, that's just on the point of profit that you were beginning with. I haven't thought, I, haven't, I actually thought you were going to go a different way in, that, in your question, which was, that, of course, in the Reformation period, there was a lot of concern about the occult, about things that were magical. I mean, there's a whole you know, centuries-long tension, which I frankly don't know a lot about, um, but I, I know it's out there. Even things that you know, happened in Salem and how the Puritans you know, thought about the, the reality of spirit, spiritual forces and spiritual warfare. So I could imagine somebody thinking that having a wizard in a story is bad for that reason. You're actually making a slightly different point, though, which is, and was that specific to the reformers generally or specific to the radical reformers? So the radical reformers, interestingly, interesting, they, um, people saw them not in this prophetic category, but in this sort of wizard category, which is a bad thing. Yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. I mean, it just is, it's an illustration that the category of wizard fits somewhat uneasily into certain Christian sensibilities about how God does his work in the world. And so you, that's where the fantasy element, I think, of Lord of the Rings helps us, because we're in a fantasy world to that extent. Yeah. What I find so interesting about that is Deuteronomy 18, of course, launches with, you will not secure the will of the gods, and the list goes on, necromancers and and wizards and magicians and the like, because the role of a divine intermediary was established in the ancient Near East, and the prophet is, is a tilt on that, and even the naming of the prophet. So it's so intriguing to me that a wizard problem would come up later, um, where it was quite a problem in Israel's world. So in, in another way to say that is that the the, the prophets, the, the wizard would be the antithesis of the prophet in the Israel context in many ways. Um, so here you have a kind of sanctified wizard in the baptized imagination of J.R.R. Tolkien. But at his, wizard, his wizard is much cleaner than, I mean, the divine intermediaries are busy reading entrails and the stars and all sorts of other um, occult practices. Um, and Gandalf isn't doing that, as far as I know. Right, right. There are no, no entrails. No, no entrails. there are no entrails. OK. <laughs> yes. Thank you for uh, exercising the freedom of applicability. 
in your talk and the lessons learned. Uh, I want to back away from that for a second and have you reflect for a couple minutes on that freedom and the limits of that freedom. Uh, how much uh, more than he knew did he say that is Tolkien? I mean, he says first unconscious, but then in revision. And he says at one place that when he got, when the story unfolded to the point where he got to the prancing pony and Bree, he didn't have any idea what had happened to Gandalf any more than the hobbits or who this guy Strider was. So you have, a, and he says in this one quote, these stories were given to me. Now, uh, in the early church interpretation of the Old Testament, they had quite a bit of freedom of applicability and allegory as well, feeling like uh, these prophets of old said much more than what they knew they said, and therefore we can go back and read them with whole greater understanding. So we deal with this in terms of interpretation of the Old Testament mm -hmm. as well from the viewpoint of the Christian perspective. So I just want to reflect for a minute. I personally greatly appreciate exercising the freedom of applicability uh, and the lessons you draw from the story. And as one who, as I said, has grown up using the language of the Lord of the Rings as kind of a code language for life, we, we do this to a great extent. Um, I guess I'm asking a much broader hermeneutical kind of question. You, I feel, in a wonderful way, give us the freedom to just mind the, the depths and the riches and the treasures of this story, but talk a bit yeah. more about your so exercise one, of the freedom of applicability. You know, one thing about applicability is I, you, we tend to like the applications that we draw that are obvious to us, and then when other people do it, we're like, I'm not sure that's really in there. So <laughs> that, that's, uh, in the, with respect to the scriptures, one of the things that legitimates the open-endedness of of Old Testament prophecy, I think, is the is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. In the, the So there's a divine authorship to Scripture that is working through the prophets. So it's not surprising if we discover a lot of fulfillments that go beyond what the, what the prophets um, anticipated. I think the applicability in a story like The Lord of the Rings is a little different than that. Um, but it's maybe it's maybe a fruit of the work of the Holy Spirit in a different way. And part of, part of what we see in, in what Tolkien talks about sub-creation um, is he writes the kind of story he writes because of the kind of person he is. He is the kind of person he is because of the work of God in his life, ultimately the work of the Holy Spirit. So then it's not surprising if there are ways in which that shows through. I think it shows through in much greater fullness in Tolkien's narrative world than it does you know, in almost any other um, fiction that you can, can think of. And it's interesting to me that Tolkien says these works were unconsciously Christian at the beginning, more self-consciously so in the revision. I think they became even more self-consciously so as Tolkien had an opportunity over the course of decades to interact with his readers. So, for example, um, there's a whole discussion around whether Lembus is Eucharistic. Whether this, you know, this bread that you eat that nourishes you and which the more you depend only on that, the greater power it has. So, I mean, to, to Roman Catholic readers particularly, that was so obvious to them. They started writing to Tolkien about it. And he's like, no, I didn't have that in mind at all. But then a little bit later on, he's like, you know, there might be kind of something to that. I, <laughs> I paraphrase here. Um, and so I think he came to be more open to this aspects of applicability as he interacted with his readers. And I think you can see that in his letters um, and how he, how he interacts with people. Um, you began your question or comment by saying there, there are limits to applicability. And I think that here's the tricky thing. When, when we turn to the scriptures, I think the limit is it has to really be there. And it has to really be there in the intention of um, the intention of the Holy Spirit and how the whole and how the Holy Spirit revealed God's word through the biblical writers. Now you still have to do all your hermeneutical discussions about what is really there. I think Tolkien is inviting us to something that's more open-ended than that. It doesn't. It's not limited to what he intended. It does have to be really there. 
but there's an open-endedness to it. And I probably like the freedom I exercise in applicability more than I might like the freedom that other people might exercise. So that would probably test my tolerances for the freedom that I've given us tonight. Someone else, come and ask a question. Yes, Lisa. So um, there's a difference between leadership and paternalism, right? And in our evangelical culture, we sometimes struggle to, we conflate the two, perhaps. So you touched on this a little bit in a couple of places. Uh, for, for one thing, I, the, the uh, prophet speaks truth that people don't want to hear. That's not paternalistic in a certain sense, at least. Um, you touched on the idea of coercion and not, not um, forcing, let's say, a Wheaton student to do something, giving them the freedom to make their own choices. But what about the opposite situation? What's, um, either through what you see in, in The Lord of the Rings or just in your own experience, when, when followers or those under your leadership are seeking safety and coming to you for safety, they're not wanting freedom from you and your authority, but safety and answers and the father figure, um, how, do you ex how, how does one exercise real leadership in that situation? What would that look like? Yeah, so. so I think one answer to that question, which is a great question, all of these questions have been super, one answer to that question is that's more a kingly role. So that, that protection and safety. So that maybe looks a little bit more like Aragorn and maybe, you know, maybe we'll get to some of that. I, I've only begun to work on the third lecture. Um, the thing that's the other thing that's challenging about that is um, what is freedom for one person may be a lack of safety for another person in a community. So that's part, I think that's part of the question that you're getting at and how do you, um, you know, and, and you see it in a family context where you want to give your children freedom to make certain kinds of choices, but then if that's having a negative consequence for another child in the house, you also have a responsibility to that child. So all of these things require you know, a lot of, a lot of wisdom. Um, yeah, those are the first things that come to mind. It, it bears further reflection though, bears further reflection. I was gonna say earlier too that something you said about paternalism prompted this for me. Uh, no, it's gone now. I had a thought as you were talking, but it's disappeared. Yes. I just might add to that thought that sometimes the safety is good for us and sometimes it's not and we need to be pushed out of that comfort zone. So somehow the leader has to be involved in discerning is that safety healthy or not? I don't know. That's as far as I got in my thought on yeah, that. Yeah, well, no, and you see that a lot in The Lord of the Rings, don't you? Because um, there are lots of dangerous paths that they go and they need somebody to encourage them to follow those paths and, and not just make the safe choice. I, I like a word in thinking about a campus community. We do talk about safety, there's a place for that. Sometimes though a better word for us is healthy. Uh, a healthy community has risk, it has things that are not safe but they're healthy. And, and family context is like that as well. Um, you know, you wanna have just the right amount of danger to make life a good learning experience. That's healthy. Thank you both so much for doing this. Uh, I found the uh, parallel between Gandalf and the prophet very insightful. Would you say there's a, an Old Testament parallel to Saruman? Great question. Dr. Richter. <laughs> so, so Saruman is, he's a foil. Most of the main characters in The Lord of the Rings have their sort of alter ego to some degree. And Gandalf very explicitly becomes Saruman as he should have been. So my first instinct, what do you think, is to say no, because usually the lying prophets don't kind of rise to that level of authority or significance in Israel. There tends to be kind of a group of lying prophets. Mm -hmm. Are there some examples, though, that would fall more in a Saruman category? The only story that's coming to mind is Micaiah ben Imlach in Kings 22, I think is where he shows up. And he is um, uh, 
sorry, but Micaiah would be the good guy. So what has happened is Ahab and Jehoshaphat are in allegiance and they're going out against an enemy and uh, the true prophet is being kept in a cistern and they have all the Baal prophets show up and they say, yeah, yeah, go to war. It's going to be great. You're going to win. And finally, Jehoshaphat says, do you have even one prophet of Yahweh here? And they pull the guy out of prison and he lies. He starts off by lying and he gets slapped and they tell him, tell the truth. He says, all right, you can't handle the truth. I'll tell you the truth. <laughs> and, um, and the truth is you're all going to die. And, and Yahweh has allowed a lying prophet to speak to you. But I think I, I, think I concur that there isn't, there isn't a character as powerful as Saruman. Mm -hmm. At least not, this is it, not from the biblical narrator's perspective. But if we were to look at this from outside the narrative, we've got Baal prophets who have a whole lot more influence than Yahweh prophets. So maybe we could look at it that way. Mm -hmm. God forbid I challenge a doctor. Uh, you, may, you may have overlooked um, Balaam. He saw truly, mm -hmm. but he wished he would live, you know, have their heritage, but mm -hmm. he failed. He didn't get it. He was killed in a battle later. So he saw, I see that star <laughs> rising out of the, you know, he even prophesied by the Messiah. He says, well, aren't you going to curse them for me? He says, I can't curse what God's blessed. Mm -hmm. And he said, and you're trying to figure out, is he part of the covenant people or not? And I've actually run across someone like this who was what we would call a good wit, white witch who later converted to Christ, mm -hmm. thank God. But basically, they're so spiritually sensitive, they can see, mm -hmm. but they're not part of the covenant people. They're not under the protection. They're not under the king. And then, of course, you see what happens to Balaam later. So we have like, Saruman who has knowledge and wisdom and sees, and, you know, we must give in. But then his end at worm tongue, the knife in the back. Mm -hmm. I think Balaam would probably be the closest uh, to that. Or maybe King Saul who prophesies, yet yeah, his end is terrible. Hmm. Just an overall scope of things. Hmm. But that's, that's all. That's that. interesting. Yeah. You tend to get more examples of kings that are bad that are at that yes. level of um, nationwide influence than the bad prophets. Yeah. I'd like to suggest two more candidates. Uh, one, um, Eli, who was a godly high priest, and yet in his latter days he so badly uh, betrayed the role that he was supposed to be in that God cursed his household and said, uh, there's always going to be someone in your household that's uh, hurting because you've, uh, you've, uh, you've uh, disgraced my name. And so Eli then becomes a foil for Samuel after having first mm -hmm. raised him up. Uh, and Samuel is the one that has to pronounce the, the God's curse on Eli and his household. Another possibility is the the unnamed prophet of Bethel in uh, First Kings thirteen, mm -hmm. who used to be a true prophet of God, but he decided to ally himself with uh, <coughs> Jeroboam when he sets up the false kingdom. A prophet comes out of Judah mm -hmm. to rebuke him, and he deceives him, lies to him, and actually causes his death by bringing him back to eat at his house and sending him back on the, the road that he wasn't supposed to go on. And then he turns around and honors the true prophet in his death. But uh, the picture perhaps needs to be worked out more clearly. I'm not giving a, a clear, but these are two candidates of people who were good at first, had God's power working through them. Mm -hmm. Both mm -hmm. of them prophesied truth about the future, but ended up being betrayers. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Now, we are officially past our yeah. drop dead moment, but I thought, Eric, did you have a question? Is that why you were leading this way? Okay. How about you be our last? Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for this, and thanks for the Wade Center um, for putting it together. Um, and as a visual learner, I really appreciated the, the visuals. And since you put in some videos of, and, you know, from the movies, I thought um, from what you presented, it seems obvious that there's some high points that the movies do well of catching some of the, 
more prophetic elements of, of Gandalf. Do you think there's some ways the movies fail in presenting him yeah, well? Yeah, well, this was gonna be a brief question. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's a pretty big topic. So I'm, this is fresh in my mind because I was just looking today at an article about, um, just on this very topic, in which the author was quoting what Tolkien said when he was asked if this thing should ever be put on the screen. His concern was mainly this, that even if you got the plot right and the storyline right, you might get the heart of the characters wrong and miss the heart of the story. And he said this partly on the basis of a screenplay that somebody that gave him that he had no time for at all. And um, I think, I mean, Dr. Richter, why don't you just make the comment you were making when we were talking before about kind of the violence and how that plays into it, because I thought that was a good comment on this, just this topic. I, I had myself felt pretty good about the first movie, but I felt that the second and the third took every violent scene, every negative character, and um, expanded them exponentially. And so the sweet friendships between Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli and, and the you know, this embodiment of everything I would say good and true about humans in league as one got stripped out of those last two movies, I thought. Yeah, and what you miss then partly is more of the inner drama where that character gets more fully developed and unfolded, yeah. I like that phrase, inner drama. Okay, so it's time for snacks and a last announcement. Yeah, well, thank you, first of all, Dr. Reich and Dr. Richter. Mr. Walter. Thank you all for coming in, Walter and Darlene, especially, thank you. And just want a, a special word to the Wheaton College students here. If you take a moment as you go by the front desk and you put your name on a list and you come to the next two lectures, um, you will be eligible for a personally signed copy of the published lectures when the book comes out. So that's just a little extra thing for those of you who are Wheaton College students and it's at the front desk. So once again, Thank you, Dr. Reich and Dr. Richter. Thank you. Thank you.